-hmm. which, you know, when all that demand stops and you're still pumping or you still have all that excess oil, literally there's nowhere for them to put it. Right. It, and then to answer your next question is buying a good investment. Cause you see a lot of people like some, some people who have that kind of investor mentality, they see something at negative or low prices and, and, and they think it's automatically, you know, a smart investment or a good buy. I want to buy this. It's negative. It has to go back up. I put, I put oil or gasoline in my F-150. Uh, to me, that answer is no. In, in, unless like you're a commodities trader and you have experience trading oil. Like, what are you doing, man? You're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. But that that's a lot of who's buying. Uh, you know, we're talking about Robinhood released the information that it's mostly retail clients that are buying, you know, the ETF that tracks the oil prices. What does that say? Like, you know, yeah. just because the price went low, it's a, it's a buy. I mean, what if, what if the fund just collapses? Yeah, I mean, and and go ahead. That's a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you're saying like, what's the worst so that could happen, it'll eventually go up. Well, you know, if you're buying a, a, exchange traded fund that's tracking the price well what if the fund's not there anymore <laughs> what happens to your money and my feeling is is what happens if the demand for oil never comes back i mean what happens if demand is so low for so long that uh, you know because nobody's driving so many less people are driving so our, our 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 earth has become more healthy essentially during this time and what happens really if we never really get that much more dependent on it again, where we become that much more energy efficient during this time. Could that demand, I mean, that demand could essentially never go back to where it was. Yeah. Or stay this low for a long time, right. which is even lower than when oil actually was first produced and sold, which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, you could see this trickling effect having a three, five, seven year process and, you know, if companies advance and continue to advance in energy efficiency, we never may, de may, may depend on the at these levels ever again. Right. Yeah, I, absolutely. So to, to your thought, oil may not be the best investment, I guess. I have to co-sign on that. Uh, Airbnb announced it laid off 25% of its workforce. Um, Tell us a little bit about what's happening with Airbnb. I think it's absolutely fascinating. It's just, it's such a newer market over the last five years. What's happening with their company? Yeah, I, Josh and I went back and forth about this on the last podcast. Um, but Airbnb is really, really struggling right now. Um, some areas are not allowing people to book Airbnb, some cities and, and, and local governments. So that mixed with the fact that people are staying at home, right? Because they're social distancing is killing the hosts, right? So the people who rent out Airbnb properties here are called hosts. And a lot of those hosts, what they ended up doing is they did the, uh, the rental real estate tactic, right? They took the cash flow property from one house and used that to buy another and then another. And before they knew it, they had portfolios, you know, you know, five to 20 different Airbnb rentals that, when vacations are happening and rental season's good, they're making a ton of money. Well, now uh, the rental season is not good and they're getting crushed, right? Because they got to make a mortgage payment on however many Airbnb homes they have. Uh, so Airbnb, the company itself, though, is now hurting because they have zero revenue. And they just announced that they're laying off at least 25% of their workforce which is truly sad because the company was planning an initial public offering for this year. And that's been delayed now. So all these employees who thought they were going to cash out their stock options now are not, and they don't have a job. It's probably one of the saddest stories that, that's coming out of this recession. Uh, that's not death. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be a major blow to employees who have been there since the beginning who had these stock options that they can't cash these in now. Uh, really sad. Um, I know that Airbnb set up a $250 million fund to compensate for lost revenue um, for the hosts, these, these people who have these houses uh, that are the hosts. Uh, you know, they seem to be trying to do all the right things. I mean, the founder took a salary cut, uh, spec took pay cuts. Um, they postponed their hiring. They, they seem to be taking the right measures. 
it seems like they're just having to make some really tough choices on how do we get this side of, of the market going again. Although, as we sort of talked about, and Josh, you made a point too on the last podcast, I feel like Airbnb would be the preferred method of travel once everyone gets a little bit more comfortable, it, possibly in the next month or two versus, you know, going to a hotel and, and being surrounded by a bunch of people. Yeah. Yeah. And having your own space, you know, you can have the, the right sanitation steps um, taken in, inside the home as a guest and for the, the host to take. And, you know, you're not in this facility with a bunch of recycled air with, you know, hundreds of other people like a hotel or, or something similar. So I think there's definitely an opportunity for them. And you can see, you know, like you said, Brent, they're taking a lot of right steps. They're trying to raise funding to get them through this period. But, um, you know, it definitely sad. I, Matt, I agree with you. Feel sad for the employees through this time because it's, you know, never in a million years I think that they would have thought this this would happen. Yeah, it, it I, it's actually so sad and bad that I actually looked up where they have their main offices at because I figure real estate in those economies uh, could be depressed, especially uh, San Francisco, mm. where it looks like the majority of their employees are housed. So just awful. It sounds like the area of uh, rentals that will come back the soonest, though, are, are the rural properties, like properties that have fresh air, maybe like in the mountains or, you know, spaced out areas, you're not in densely popula populated areas. It sounds like those are the areas that are going to be the most desirable. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. What I, I was reading today, CNBC wrote an article, though, that they're feeling the crunch even more because some of the short-term rental uh, hosts are collaborating to just launch their own service to connect to guests. Um, and so, you know, it was something that I guess a lot of the hosts were collaborating for a while, a lot of the bigger hosts with multiple properties and stuff like that. Um, but that's an interesting kind of story to keep track of, of, you know, is there even more opportunity that sees through this time now that Airbnb struggling, you know, are they going to be hurting somewhere else as well in the fact of losing hosts to a different platform? All I would say to those people is uh, good luck, man, because Airbnb <laughs> is a perp, right? Like it's like how Zoom is, right? Like, oh, we're going to jump on a Zoom or Google that. Let's grab yeah. an Airbnb for the weekend. Like they have way too much brand equity. Uh, but yeah. I do wish those people great luck in that strategy. All right, let's go on to the retirement corner. It's one of my favorite corners of this show. Uh, what are some strategies people can do when their retirement accounts are down right now? Josh, maybe let's start with you on this one. Uh, what can people do right now? Um, I think just take advantage, like have the mindset of take advantage of, you know, what the market's giving you. So we, we talked about it on a couple previous podcasts too, but take advantage of um, investing maybe some cash that you have that's excess of your emergency fund. Um, take advantage um, and contribute even more into your retirement accounts um, and take advantage of the low stock prices and maybe even rebalance um, in your account to get more aggressive. So uh, if you have that mindset of, you know, what opportunities can I take through this period? There's a lot of different strategies that are out there right now that, you know, are going to help you in the future if you do have that mindset to take advantage of what the market's given you. Tell the uh, listeners again what rebalance means. So rebalancing um, in a portfolio, to give you an example of the time right now, it, it can be done for a couple of different reasons, but right now the stock market's down, so your stock percentages might have changed. Um, and rebalancing, what it would be doing is selling one of the allocations. Let's take, if you have a stock and bond portfolio, you'd be selling some of the bonds and purchasing more of stocks to so getting back to whatever your target rate of, uh, allocation was originally. So the um, best example that I, I like to use too, you buy a car, you drive it, eventually it gets out of balance, you need to realign it. That's what rebalancing really is for a portfolio. Um, and it can help rate, with rates of return long-term um, if you continue to practice that strategy. Um, and with that rebalance too, you can get more aggressive than what your target original re allocation was as well. So you know, take an example, if you had 40% stock um, in a portfolio in 60% um, bonds. And now you can actually rebalance that portfolio to 60% stocks and 40% bonds with that, with that transaction. So getting more aggressive at a time that stock prices are, are down. 
um, which could also help to lead to higher expected returns. You know, it's funny too, is because a lot of these conversations that I've had with a lot of people and clients on, on rebalancing right now, they're, they're almost of the opposite mindset. Like I don't want to buy any more stocks right now, but right now is actually the time if you are going to rebalance where things are a lot cheaper than they were three months ago or four months ago to actually be buying more stocks. So it kind of takes you to make an emotional decision that may not seem sensible right now, just because of where the market is and the uncertainty, but that's what really helps catapult you to better times. Yeah, hundred percent. That's human nature, man. I mean, nobody wants to buy that brand new golf driver when it's full price, but when it's on sale, people run to the golf store, buy that driver, right? Right. Same I'm thing with you. stocks. Yeah. It's just I, always, I always think of the time though, like, and, and I ask this question a lot to my clients, like, would, would you sell your house if it declined 30%? Like, right. and most people that I've asked that question to say no. And, and you know, why is it human nature that, to say, okay, well, the stock prices went down, but I'm going to now sell my stocks, even though you wouldn't do it with an asset like your home. Why is that different? I don't know. Stocks, stocks, for whatever reason, just make people do the opposite of what they normally do in life, which is kind of interesting. Another cool strategy to look at uh, for a certain segment of, of uh, potential retirees is Roth conversions. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so if you're super high income, um, you got a couple million in your 401k, uh, you know, you're making mid six figures, 250 or more, and you you most likely are going to end up with high retirement income through your RMDs could make sense now to do some Roth conversions. Um, if, if you don't quite meet those metrics, most studies have shown that a Roth conversion really isn't going to help you. Um, your, your tax rate in retirement is going to be a lot lower, especially if you're, you just have social security coming to you and maybe, you know, a couple thousand a month coming out of your 401k or IRA, then probably Roth conversion doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but if you're in that upper echelon, you're that high net worth clientele, a couple million dollars in retirement accounts, plus a high, high income in retirement coming to you, Roth conversion can make a lot of sense right now. Yeah, and I think one of the things, which I, I, I have some pushback on that. I, I do think it does make sense for people even in lower tax brackets this year uh, to do either Roth conversions or just take money out. Like, let's say you're over 72 and you have a required minimum distribution that was supposed to be done this year and you're not forced to take it. Yeah, you don't have to take, let's just say the 15,000 distribution. But if you know you're going to be in a lower tax bracket this year than you're going to be next year, why not take the five or 10,000 out that by choice and pay 15%, let's say in a tax bracket versus taking it out next year when you could be in a 20% tax bracket because the income would be higher. And that could be true for people who are, you know, just turning 60. They're not working right now. They expect to go back to work next year. Their income is going to be less this year. And if you can get money out of your IRA right now, and it doesn't have to be by conversion, it could just be getting it out. If you get money out of your IRA at a lower tax rate right now, it may make sense to do it because you pay 15 cents on every dollar versus 20 cents on every dollar. That's a good point. Yeah. If you can look at bracket splitting and stuff, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, a strategy for people to implement that I've, I just, I've always felt very strong in a, in a time like something similar to we're in or stock prices are down is if you are contributing to a 401k plan, like my feeling is, is every contribution that you're making out of your paycheck, whether it's biweekly, weekly, or monthly, like that, all that money should really be put into stocks. Like why buy bonds right now? Who wants to buy bonds? Like why wouldn't you want to take advantage of the prices when you're making ongoing contributions? I mean, your dollar cost averaging in stocks, you really want a dollar cost average into bonds right now? You can make the outcome, you can make the kind of guess that bonds could be even more risky than they've been going forward. So, you know, it, it, I guess it's hard to make an argument to, to buy bonds right now, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, a lot of people in 401ks, though, have target date funds or, you know, and, or balance funds. Right. Um, and those are good tools. You know, a lot of times they are more heavily weighted to stocks if you're, you know, definitely younger and not reaching right to retirement. Um, but uh, I agree that that's, you know, definitely look at where your allocations are going because stocks are, are the, the good idea right now. 
and, and let me make sure I, I clarify that specifically. I'm not talking about 